Today's episode is sponsored by EditPods. EditPods provide full-service podcast editing that's all in one podcast editing without breaking the bank. Now, one of the biggest problems that I have when running this podcast is the time it takes to edit, clip, upload, and post my podcast in all of the right places with some new artwork, links, descriptions, and all of the jazz that comes along with it. Now, what EditPods do is help podcasters skip all the hassle and focus directly on making the best show possible, freeing our minds to help hone the craft instead of spending time writing copy and doing transcripts and finding links, all of these time-consuming activities. So EditPods work with podcasters that want to focus their time on areas of excellence and take the rest off their plate. If that sounds good to you, you can use the coupon code CHATTER to get $30 off basic or plus or $50 off a premium for the first month. That's CHATTER, C-H-A-T-T-E-R, for $30 or $50 off your first month at EditPods. Make podcasting fun again. So yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's get going. So um, hello everyone, welcome to another episode of CHATTER. Today I'm here with Tom Burgess, author of Kleptopia. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. No problem. So yeah. To be here. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's beautiful space. Unfortunately, um, the, it's a beautiful wooden box. Yeah, it's a little wooden surrounded box surrounded by other beautiful spaces. Yes, we were meant to be in one of the other beautiful spaces, but this will do for now. No, it's 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 spot on. <laughs> I mean, we're still building towards having an actual studio where I can come in and get people drunk. That's the that's the dream. Well, that is the dream. Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been a reporter for like nearly twenty years now. I appreciate the importance of being drunk. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, I was very good at that as a bartender. Mm. So I feel, why not combine my skills? And <laughs> bring <laughs> right. people in, interview them about serious topics, bring them pissed at the same time. Is the... Yeah, it's a bit, becoming a bit of a lost art in journalism, actually. The, um, the, the, the well-timed drunken lunch with a, with a sauce. This, this, it still has its place, but um, people are sort of furiously DMing people these days as opposed to taking them out for a long lunch on, on the thing that used to be called company expenses. Mm. And... Uh, so I think some of the great stories evolved that way. I think we're missing a trick there. Yeah, man, you get people a wee bit loose-tongued, you know. Yeah, and and also, the, it's it's just you create. It's very hard to create an informal environment electronically, and that's what you want. Yeah, people yeah. for people to relax and people to tell you the thing that you didn't know you were looking for. Exactly, that's the real key. Mm. Um, so to start off, an easy question for you. Um, you write a lot about about dirty money, and especially you sort of spoke a lot about it in that that mini doc we were speaking about that you did for the FT about Russian money in in Britain. Mm. And I wanted to ask: Are you not also financially benefiting from dirty money because you're given a job by having something to write about? Um, <laughs> it, I, I, I remember when uh, my first book came out, The Looting Machine, which was about corruption in Africa. And how um, the oil and mining industries create a lot of the conflict and corruption that that we incorrectly imagine is kind of flowing out of Africa. Actually, it flows in from mm. the outside. And um, that whole book. So I'm going to take a light question to it's something really heavy. That's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back to like bit at the end. That that whole book came from a moment in 2010 when I was a correspondent in West Africa, and uh, you have to cover some quite heavy things. And one of which was uh, a, a massacre that took place in central Nigeria. Um, and the coverage of that kind of violence tends to be. Christians versus Muslims, or if you get a little bit deeper into it, in this case, it's Brom versus Fulani. Um, and you frame it entirely in those kind of tribal terms. And it was utterly nightmarish. Uh, an entire village had been killed, the one I got to anyway, including the children uh, whose bodies had been burned. Yeah. And uh, impossible to know whether those bodies had been burned before or after they died. Before I had children myself. Um, but it's obviously the kind of thing that 
you don't forget. And um, I stayed a bit longer and tried to figure out whether that tribal story was the whole thing. And you get deeper into it and you start to see that actually what's going on isn't first and foremost kind of tribal hatred or whatever it may be. It's corruption. So Nigeria, this massive country, you know, 200 odd million people. Whoa. Yeah. No one really knows. No. 80 million, 200 million. Jeez, I didn't know it was that big. It's the hot Russia. Okay. That's the way to think of it. Okay. Massive oil and gas reserves. Same hot. That have completely, <laughs> that have completely corrupted the political system. Um, and, well, I mean, we could go more into the comparisons, you know, prodigious novelists and so on, but, um, that's what's always happening in Nigeria is trying to get a piece of the oil money. You've either got, um, you've either got hold of one of the capillaries of the oil system, or you could starve to death. And there's a bit in between, but actually not that much. And what was going on in uh, in Jos, the city where, I, where the, outside which their massacre happened, was an ultra local version of that game. So basically, in, if you wanted to design a place to run well, to be Sweden, whatever it may be, you would have mass employment, broadly equal incomes, and everyone chips in a little bit to fund the government. So that if, if if people who hold political power start to do abusive things with that power, people can just withdraw their consent by withdrawing their funding, just stop paying taxes, threaten to stop paying taxes. That's essentially the deal, isn't it? And then you get to change that government. If you wanted to do the opposite, have a state based on arbitrary power, where those who hold power can use that power just to enrich themselves, you'd create a system where there's a big pot of money that comes in from outside the country. So the people who hold power just need to make sure they can get their hands on that. They have no need of the consent of the people to rule. And there's no consent to withdraw. So if we all decide, if we're all in Nigeria, and we decide actually that enough is enough, which was the name of one of the protest movements at the time, actually. Enough is enough. We are going to, what? March? Get shot. Stop paying taxes? No one pays taxes. Stop the oil coming out of the ground. Good, you know, good luck dealing with shell security. <laughs> there is no way to hold power to account. So in Joss, what was happening was the, the local version of that. A governor, a state governor, Jonah Jang was his name. His name was written in the ash on the walls. Presiding over one of the local nodes of this kleptocracy, right? Kleptocracy, a system that's run on corruption, so that those who hold power can steal and enrich themselves. A kleptocracy. Jonah Zhang's running the local bit of that. But you have to have a communication with the people under you, right? It, it, regardless of the type of system, there has to be a story. There has to be uh, that there is a public conversation, even in North Korea. But you can't really say, I invite you to vote me in for five further years as governor vote, uh, based on my record as a thief. Even though you will have filled a few pockets, it's not really the line. And you obviously can't say, you know, I invite you to um, to vote me in for another five years based on my record of delivering roads and hospitals and so on, because your your mates have stolen all the contracts to do all those things, and there aren't any roads or hospitals, or if they are, they don't work very well. So you have to have a different bond to maintain loyalty. What do you do? What everybody does, you fall back on identity. on an ethnic, tribal identity, group identity. Jonah Jang, in this case, stirring up hatred among one ethnic group, mostly Christian, against outsiders seeming to come to dominate them. Mm. It's exactly the same playbook as Trump's bad hombres or the Uyghurs in China, mm. um, the you know liberals in Russia, there's a there's a long list of them at the end of Kleptopia, actually. Um, the Jews in Nazi Germany, the Tutsi in Rwanda. Any corrupt system needs its outsider. And as you keep stealing, you keep ratcheting up that rhetoric. 
keep tapping into that feeling. Any one of us could fall into that trap. Any one of us born in that place mm. would have our capacity for ethnic hatred ignited. Mm. And that gets you to a burnt village. Now, um, a couple of years later, it became apparent that I was carrying around the ghost of this dead village. And I, had a, I, had a, I write about this briefly at the start of my first book. This is coming back a long way around to your question. <laughs> And the idea, one of the things that really tormented me was this idea of complicity and guilt. To, to, to what extent, for a long while, I, I, I did feel sort of tremendously personally guilty that I was able to just leave. I think a lot, a lot of people in situations like that feel something along those lines. I, I wasn't anything particularly special. It happens all the time. You know, I did just, I did just leave. Um, although I tried hard to work out what, what had happened and report on it and so on. Obviously, I was to leave and go back to my very comfortable life and more broadly i started to figure out we are all complicit to some extent in that even if our cars aren't filled sometimes our cars are filled with nigerian crude oil um and it doesn't take much to work out the how that oil comes out of the ground the, the environmental damage the human carnage that results from that and the corruption and to what extent are we complicit in that? So that's my, that was the starting point for the first question, for the first book. And, the, and, the, and ever since I've been grappling with this idea of to, to what extent are we complicit in kleptocracy? You can, this, this we can be a shifting idea. And so your question is essentially to what extent are journalists complicit in it by writing about it? Mm. I think you have to be alive to that. Um, and always just be checking your own conflicts of interest. Mm. I don't, I, I, I've had people in Africa ask me that question. You know, you're just, you know, you, you're sitting here asking me about my starving child, but you've got a book deal. There's no way of excusing that way. It is, it is part of the picture. Um, absolutely. I'm not, I'm not sure I've got a more sort of um, profound answer to it than that. But I guess one thing I would say is we don't make a great deal of money. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 but I, I do also think that like it's quite important to be alive to like do the private eye test on yourself mm. so um you know are you are you, are you profiting gratuitously mm. from essentially from the risks that sources take um now you know, you're paying me fifteen thousand pounds for this podcast, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah, um, in some might say that's excessive, <laughs> and some might say it's hypocritical. That's been wired to my the Swiss account in the name of my British Virgin Islands front company. But mm. you know, at least at least we're being open about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, at least it didn't come on. Sure, I was coming straight from my Cayman account. Um, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, you know, the, the, if a, you know, if, if a tree falls in a forest, does it make a sound? No one needs to know about any of this. No. I Shame if we were recording this. I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know that, that was Nixon's mistake, I think, yeah. wasn't it? But, um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I mean, you know, what people won't know, don't know, won't hurt them. Yeah. <laughs> there we are. What a fudge, eh? That was well. I mean, that was a great. <laughs> this chair's a bit broke. That was a great answer to uh, a very jovial <laughs> question. An um, question. Kind of threw me, <laughs> threw me there, didn't you? Like I was trying to take the piss, and you come back with a really serious answer. Um, so, do you feel you ever get desensitized to that kind of? Poverty and death and destroyed, like just the horrors that you you see in in because I mean I've I've not had the the pleasure or the the privilege to like report or yeah maybe the opportunity to report overseas or to like travel a lot for for writing things like I mean most of it's just been talking to people like this for most of my my journalism. Do have you yeah do you think you're ever desensitized to to the to the yeah the real horrors of the things that you're writing about because like obviously you, you've covered yeah africa um i was reading uh some of your your coverage of um the the kazakh mining company that that attempted to sue you mm. um, which it, well, i'm did sure we'll get to did sue yeah. you well yeah. unsuccessfully sued yeah you. yeah um and was it the e e n e n r c e n r c that's it yeah um and obviously they're yeah they were they were coming after you because they believed that you were implying that they had been 
part to several murders, I believe. That they'd been murdering people. Yeah, that yes. a holding company, their position was that I had written that a holding company in London had been murdering people. Okay. Well. Well. Not exactly a nice business to, to have to write about. Like, do you, do, you, do you find it easy to, like, detach yourselves from that? Well, I mean, the first thing I should say is that I don't do anything like as much kind of frontline reporting as many of my foot far better colleagues you know, um, who are in Ukraine, for instance, as we speak. Um, but I have done some of that sort of stuff and, I, I, and I've done quite a lot of, um, I, I've done a certain amount of just, you know, being on the ground where shit's happening, but also um, a certain amount of trying to piece together awful things that I didn't witness firsthand. For instance, I, in Kleptopia, my latest book, I write about um, the massacre at Zanozen. Um, Zanozen's this kind of godforsaken spot in the middle of the steppe in Kazakhstan near the Caspian Sea, another kind of spigot of the global oil, eco oil economy that is the foundation of our civilized world. Um, Civilized worlds, maybe the wrong way of putting it. Of our, hmm. it's the it's it's the, the engines world. of the industrialized world. Yeah. Isn't it? Um, and in Zanos and um, a group of oil workers went on strike against corruption, among other things. This is in in Kazakhstan, one of the it's along the works along the lines of Russia, another ex-Soviet republic run by a strong man, into whose pocket oil companies. It's been run by the Gladly same guy puts. since uh, 89, right? Yes, he's recently kind of stepped back into oh, a really? more okay. godfatherly role. Okay. Nusultan Nazarbayev, yeah. One of these people who very quickly was able to switch from communist to capitalist. Mm. And within a few years was having massive deposits made into his Swiss bank accounts by American oil companies. Oh, convenient. Yeah. Um, yes, you know, to keep him in the manner to which he rapidly became accustomed. Uh, and he was turned Kazakhstan into this extraordinary kleptocracy, extraordinary and, and so fascinating because it's it's one of the ones that's most globalised, um, that's most plugged into the global economy. You know, it sits on this fulcrum between Russia and China. It's full of American oil companies. It brings in all manner of sort of consultants and PR experts, um, some of whom I write about in the, in, in the book. But you were asking about um, essentially does, does, does covering um, awful stuff in your head mm. I think one of the things I, I i mean no there are things you just see uh often on the kind of you know inside of your eyes um and i did i did have a lot of treatment for ptsd which which is um it more or less sorted me out um but one of the interesting things that happened um covering the massacre in zanozin um is that i noticed that you know, it's sort of sneaking around in the back of a car uh, in this town that's still meant to be pretty much off limits to journalists, but you, you can you can you can wriggle really away in there, um, meeting people and talking to people who who had either been in the public square when the security forces opened fire on the strike, on the strikers, or or people who had either first or second hand knowledge of the torture that ensued, and. I can now remember what happened in the square, and I can, I can, I, I can remember what happened in the torture chambers. And and in my mind's eye, they have the same quality as my own memories, even though I was there for neither of those things. Um, and I've seen photographs of what happened in the square and some footage. There is no footage of what happened in the torture chambers. And I, I think this is how this is how human minds work, isn't it? We we absorb kind of common memories into our own and put them into stories. Um, and that's another thing you've got to kind of watch how, how your own myth making about your own life and your own experiences shaping your attempt to do objective journalism. I mean, all, all of this really is about story making and and challenging the stories of the powerful. You know, that massacre in Zanos, and the reason that those people were being tortured, I mean, I write about what happened to Rosa Tulatieva, and she finally broke when they 
threatened to rape her daughter to the point that she would cry tears of blood watching this happen to her daughter. That's what was really happening by the security forces who sustain a kleptocracy, right? a system that is that functions in the interests of those who wield power. That's what really happens. That's the purpose of journalism is to go there and find out what's actually happening. Mm. And, you know, what could happen to any one of us if we lived in a kleptocracy? But that the, the struggle is the struggle of that reality against the story-making power of the kleptocrats and, crucially, those who, their story-makers that mm. they hire in. So that could be lawyers of the type I've counted a lot of <laughs> reputation management firms in London. <laughs> that could be propagandists. Yeah. Um, there's there's an incredible sequence in in Kleptopia of what happens in the in the weeks after that massacre. Mm. So those guys are getting tortured so that they can be put up for a show trial, in which they will be convicted of causing the violence that led to their friends being killed. It's very obviously caused by the security forces. But that, that was the false narrative. Mm -hmm. You can peddle that kind of stuff within a, system, within a country like Kazakhstan where you have pretty tight media control, but you also need a kind of international version for less easily controlled um, places such as the UK. You need to keep that legitimacy because you need the global market to go on treating you as the, a legitimate business partner someone from whom you can legitimately buy oil and uranium and that's the big lie of the global economy mm. whether it's the kazakh dictator or the dictator in equatorial guinea whoever it may be putin himself we have to treat these people by and large as though somehow they have the consent of their people to sell the oil and gas that lies under that soil i mean it seems so obvious and you you, you laugh and so do i but it's bollocks yeah Anyway, so what does Nazarbayev like do? That, it's really like <laughs> Nazarbayev's like shit. I've got to do this speech in Cambridge. You know, mm. it's penciled in. It's a few weeks away, but there's just been this massacre, very inconveniently, by my security forces. <laughs> and we've tortured the guys, and you know, we're, we're going to have the show trial, and there's going to be this kind of heavily perspiring judge giving them seven year sentences. It's kind of <laughs> Alice in Wonderland <laughs> court. But what am I going to say in Cambridge? You know, I'm going to Cambridge. This is one of the moments when I get to really kind of polish up my uh, my legitimate mask for the, for the for the big lie who knows what to do about this you know who knows how to um, how to communicate um to a western audience who's who's the best of recent times i got hold of this letter yeah, and it's it's a it's a letter giving very good very um skillful propaganda advice to nazarbayev um and it's on how to frame the massacre in this way. Use, first of all, you use the big buzzword. So this is um, uh, 2011. Use the big buzzword, stability. That's what Westerners love to hear, mm. especially since 9-11. Stability, yeah. and even more so since um, 2008. Political Peace, stability, security. stability against yeah. risk, against terrorists. So Nazarbayev has let the Coalition of the Willing use... Um, military installations in Kazakhstan as, 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 as rear bases for the, for the war in Afghanistan. What about economic stability after 2008? You know, here's a stable partner for um, energy, energy security, oil and gas under the Caspian Sea, that kind of thing, uranium. Um, to frame it like that and say, yes, you can demand reforms of us. And yes, my goodness, we are making reforms. I mean, look at this long list of reforms we've made. Um, but, you know, we, 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 are, we are trying our best. Don't rush us because think of the chaos that could ensue if, um, if the strong hand of dictatorship wasn't here. Mm. Anyway, this letter of advice is, is handwritten and it says from memory, um, hope to see you in London soon. Yours, Tony Blair. Blair's consultancy has been doing some work in Kazakhstan. He's obviously been doing work, work in lots of other places. And is it charitable work or is it paid work? The question. <laughs> Something I think that a lot of people who study Blair's activities these days mm. find hard to discern. You know, there's there's the work for JP Morgan, there's the there's the there's the advice on governance, there's yes, the charitable work. 
I mean, just as an aside, I don't, how old are you? 28. Right, so I'm 40. I grew up in Manchester. Mm. So I used to love Blair. <laughs> I mean, growing up in the 90s, it was like Oasis, and then suddenly there was Blair. Mm. So I was like a teenager in Manchester blur. in the 90s. No. Well, hang on, hang on. <laughs> hang on a second. Who? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there was... Um, and uh, it, it was an extraordinary moment, actually. And, and I think uh, whether, whether or not your own sort of family political background was, anything like that, there was this extraordinary moment. Um, and it, it, it really did seem like the future was, was golden. And, and, and I think Blair you does have music. fantastic music. Yeah, but but also Blair it, then does go on to have these extraordinary mm. achievements. Domestically, mm -hmm. and arguably some foreign ones too. Um, and and his transition from that into what he is now, um, essentially monetizing himself, his access, his credibility, in the service, I would argue, of some of the world's most menacing kleptocrats, is heartbreaking. Mm. And that's what I was feeling as I wrote that passage in, in, in the book. Um, and this is, we've gone once again, sorry, we've gone a long way from your question about like, you know, how do you deal with suffering and horror? I, I think part, part of why I bring Blair in as well and what he was doing there for Nazarbayev is we're, we're all sort of jostling with the mixture of the stories we tell about ourselves and the stories we tell about the world mm. um but for <laughs> for journalists and especially photographers who are exposed you know a fair bit or in some cases like um almost constantly to the worst human suffering it does start to just fuck you up because because our story making processes start to break down I think in the, in the face of that, there's um, Virgil Keane's got a book coming out later this year about PTSD, which is, um, by all accounts, going to be extraordinary. Okay. Um, uh, and I think it is PTSD is something interesting because it is about the sort of breakdown of our ability to form what we can, what we witness into coherent stories, without which your the, the the thing we call the self kind of breaks down. And that, I mean, we can go off in all sorts of other directions, but there's, that's a uh, second very long attempt yeah, that's to I, answer your, I can't get your question. I mean, <laughs> how long have we got? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't. <laughs> I can, right. you, maybe you should like, cut it in Paxman style. Yeah. No, no, I hate doing that. I hate interrupting <laughs> people when they are when they have a really good answer. I, I never like to tell anyone they can only take so long to give me an answer because sometimes it takes that long. Yeah, well, I don't I mean, there might be some quicker ones. Too. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, I tend to be, I, I tend to ask or yeah, give very long answers to things sometimes. So I never would like to be told, stop telling your story, <laughs> basically. Um, although I can't get right now the picture of Blair singing Country House out of my head. Uh, <laughs> rather than around instead of um, Keith Allen in that video. <laughs> but I wanted to ask, because like, I mean, we, we've kind of like, not alluded to this, but we've talked a bit about sort of Klepto, kleptopia kleptocracies and most of the time whenever anyone starts like defining this kind of system i immediately like obviously i think of the the more corrupt regimes around the world but my brain just goes like britain and america like fit this definition as well like to what extent am i being dramatic do you think there? like do, do you well, do tell you me why you think that well i think that because i believe that the neither government and neither major party actually seems to have the interests of the people at heart. They seem to have the interests of their donors, who tend to be the richest and most powerful in society, even more so in America. But I think we're pretty much there in Britain, where the wealthy are driving what is important policy-wise, and that what will improve the lives of the ordinary people doesn't seem to be anywhere near top of the agenda. And the... The only things that seem to rile people up or that governments are willing to talk about or is the, the sort of like identity issues that that you sort of referenced are used 
to to great effect and great yeah great horrors in in places like africa like i mean my brain goes to all the different sort of um campaigns that i researched while i was reading writing my first book about brexit i was talking about cambridge Analytica, analytica and their sort of campaign ta tactics and techniques and that's exactly where they went identity you know wet the, the find the wedge issue divide people based on this one thing that defines you apparently and then like make people really angry about it and and britain seems to fit all of these um all of these like definitions basically for me and i i just i can't tell how how dramatic i think i'm being because obviously like it's easy to sit here in in britain where we still have many many freedoms like obviously like where the the right to protest is being slowly etched away and uh, you could argue the online safety bill is going to be in an uh, imposition on like our freedom of speech, and mm -hmm. you know there are there are ways in which those rights are being chipped away. But like, we can st I could still like walk down the middle of Downing Street, like just with a huge sign that said like "Go fuck yourself, Boris Johnson," and they'd kind of just have to accept it. And if they didn't, there'd be fucking outrage. There wouldn't be someone like rolling along in a little van and like fucking grab me in and being like oh we'll never see you again or like you know <laughs> we still have a lot of freedoms but I, I watched them sort of being etched away and i watched like the 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 difference in the application of the system of justice that's that's very much defined by your net worth and that's why i tend to think that but yeah you, you've seen more of these regimes than i have like a how dramatic how dramatic do you think i'm being no i think you've put it well actually um I think it's very important to remember that there's nothing inherent in any state or society that makes them a democracy or a kleptocracy. It's just a certain set of conditions. And this is a sliding scale. So at one end, let's put Equatorial Guinea. Putin's Russia's not far from that end either, but um, a, a country that is completely in thrall to the arbitrary, venal greed of those who hold power and maintain it in the most brutal way. Leaving aside for a second these questions of how they lock into the global economy, just that. And at the other end, maybe bits of Scandinavia, and there are little spots here, here and there around the world. Um, where there are the strongest institutions we've been able to build to safeguard the inter interests of the many. The, the rule of law, a, f a free press, and independent representatives of the people in, in a parliament. It's really those three, I'd say. Now, th there's nothing to say that any of those things are immortal. <laughs> there's nothing to say that they couldn't ever sprout forth in Equatorial Guinea. God knows there are some very brave people trying. Mm. Um, Tutu Alicante and people like that have come to some of these extraordinary characters. Um, but that's, I mean, that's what I'm, trying to, I'm trying to just put a sort of theoretical mm -hmm. version of, of what you're saying. And the only reason those institutions stay s strong is if every day individual people opt for the sanctity of that institution over their own private interests when those two things are in conflict. But it, 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 it can be that, it, put it this way, my years in Africa, I was in Latin America before that, and I spent a lot of time in the former Soviet Union. I can't always come back to this line, there's a Goethe line, where he says, I can't think of a crime I couldn't commit. I think, take you or me or anybody, and you put them in the position of my friend George, in who lives in the Niger Delta. He's got kids. He knows that he's going to encounter roadblocks. This is the, the part of Nigeria where all the onshore oil is. Um, and where the, the oil companies have this kind of grey relationship with armed militias who will occasionally kidnap their oil workers, but also will, um, you know, do the bidding, do the political enforcement of the political class who are in this kind of symbiosis with the oil companies and so on. Anyway, George is trying to get by. 
But he knows that if he's got to get through a roadblock, he's going to have to hand over a bribe. If he wants something from a politician, he's going to have to bribe them. If he wants his kid to get a school diploma, he'll probably have to bribe the teacher. If he wants his kid to um, get malaria treatment, he might have to bribe someone to get into the hospital. If I was in George's position, I would pay all of those bribes. Because otherwise my kid's going to die of malaria or not get an education. Um, or uh, that, that vital bit of political assistance I need is not is going to come. I would do all, do all of those things. Um, I dare say you would I challenge anyone to say they, they wouldn't. Um, that's what happens in, a, in, a, in an oil economy. Now, Obama made a great speech about how Africa needs big institutions, not big men. And that's the key. Like, the, the development of those institutions is what, is what, is the difference, essentially, between you, you being born in a country where you have a chance of, a decent chance of relative freedom and relative protection from arbitrary violence and, be, and, and living life subject to the daily threat of arbitrary violence. Now, are the UK and the US heading in, in more in the direction of Sweden or more in the direction of Equatorial Guinea? I think you're absolutely right that they're heading more in the direction of Equatorial Guinea. I think partly that is because for decades now, the West has been absorbing kleptocratic money. Mm. So there was this yeah, you kind of... That, you made that point really well in that, in that film that I talked about earlier, about the, the, the we, that they weren't importing Western values or like... Like Western values, but you know what I mean. They, yeah, they weren't, I mean, they weren't uh, importing like democratic values. Well, there was this moment that of... we were importing their <laughs> exactly. corrupt, corrupt values, or the the, the sort of exactly. acceptance of corruption. I think I was paraphrasing a very intelligent guy called in the states called Paul Massaro there, and it, if I've if I've got this right, um, yeah, I'll just continue to thieve it from him. That essentially, there's this moment of unbelievable hubris in the late '80s. You go back and read like George H. W. Bush's speeches at the time. It's extraordinary. Um, and you, Clinton and Blair, have this too. So there's this sense of the the West has triumphed in the Cold War. Capitalism has triumphed. So we are now going to send this kind of platoon of market consultants and accountants and bankers and lawyers into Russia, but also elsewhere in the former Soviet Union and the other kind yeah. of ex-communist yeah. outposts in the Cold War in Africa. Everyone misses that. Um, and we're going to just kind of like switch on capitalism and that's going to and we're going to remake the world in our own image um as you know liberal capitalist democracies under the american hegemony and what we are realizing to our startle horror now is that precisely the opposite was happening which is that we were plugging a global capitalist system into ultra corrupt often oil funded uh, kleptocracies which have started to remake the western democracies in their own image is it really important to remember that and i know i often fall into this trap that we're not talking about sort of one kleptocratic country versus one democratic country we're mm. talking about networks of power generally so just as there are you know fantastically brave um Democrats in the in Putin's gulags in Siberia, so there are energetic kleptocrats in London and and and, and, and New York. They're just better paid. They're just much better paid. <laughs> yeah. So so you see, and and that's why I had this idea of kleptopia is to try to get at these alliances. You know, we talk about a community of democracies. This my God, there's a community of kleptocracies, and. As I write about in the book, one of the best ways of understanding this is Trump. Mm. So again, as we were, talking, we were talking about before about kind of people appealing to tribal identities, right? That's the that's the that's the rhetoric of the kleptocrat. You strip that away and follow the money. The best advice of American journalism, fine American journalism. Um, what is Trump? Where does he come from? <laughs> right? Trump. Trump is a, a kind of brat who inherited a lot of money and wanted to look like desperate his ego men who desperate to look like a successful businessman he actually just pissed all his money away he, he he's incapable of running a successful business casinos 
property, but they all go bust. It's yeah, all yeah. there in the records. Right? Oh, yeah. It's all well known. Which makes his branding abilities incredibly impressive. Branding abilities. Mm. Yeah, but let's dig into that a bit for a second. What do we actually mean by that? Two things happen in the kind of the early noughties that make Trump into what he is. There's this tsunami of dirty money out of the kleptocracies, right? In the 90s, it's the scramble for control. Organized crime, mm. ex-KGB types, kind of the new oligarchs, Russia and the former Soviet Union, scrambling around. A lot of people get killed. A lot of people get very rich. And then they realize, right, we've made a fortune out of this lawlessness. But it is still lawless. <laughs> so what we want now for our loot, ironically enough, is the protection of the rule of law. So, so there begins this, this, this tidal wave of money into places where you have the rule of law. The London Stock Exchange, all those big listings, New York property, right? So a lot of these guys are just gangsters. Well, they, maybe they get called oligarchs, you know, a couple of removes away. And there's the, they are legitimizing themselves. We were talking about Nazarbayev doing that earlier. So there's this wall of money, and it's buying lawyers and accountants and peers of the realm sitting on boards, former prime ministers. It's getting, you know, you're getting Gerhard Schroeder to lobby for you. Um, and as this tidal wave of money goes out, um, Another thing is happening at the same time, which is the birth of um, reality television. <laughs> and these two things coincide in the person of Donald Trump. So he's able to create... <laughs> That's an quite a bad diagram. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's able to create... Uh, 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 the, the, the people who came up with... Um, what was it called, that original? Survivor. Mm. The kind of the original big reality TV thing. A kind of like using a kind of bastardized idea of Darwin to try and have this kind of like red in tooth and claw human experience of people just um, uh, fighting to be king. And then that becomes, that's turned into a, a sort of capital, capital I can't version believe we of got that. To Love Island from that because that's great TV. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, two of my younger cousins made me watch that the other day. And I, actually, you can see the sort of the evil genius dynamics under, underpinning mm. it. Anyway, but the, yeah, so there's a capitalist version of that which they call The Apprentice. Mm starring Donald Trump. So he gets to play in reality television, the clues in the name, right? He gets to play the sort of quasi real business mogul, even though he's a shit businessman. But 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 he actually does need some money. Mm. Right? He has to have some money because the, the these projects do happen. They do mm. start before they go bust. Big things do get built. Mm. And you have, you know, the opening sequences of um, the apprentice with holocaust, holocaust helicopter shots mm -hmm. of these buildings with yeah. Trump's name on it. Yeah. But where's the money coming from? Right, that's part of what I and others started to dig into mm -hmm. around the Trump, time Trump um, became president. And that's one of the stories in Kleptopia. It's like, mm -hmm. where's all that money actually come from? It's coming from Russia and elsewhere in the former Soviet Union. And it's astonishing. This meeting of... Um, people who've made massive amounts of money in the gangster economies of the former Soviet Union seeking a legitimate face, seeking to be able to translate that gangster wealth into the wealth of the, the currency of, you know, the Rockefellers, of a kind of, of, of American high society. Mm -hmm. It's kind of Gatsby transformation, yeah. right? But global. Trump was absolutely like when you really when I think about it like this, Trump was super desperate to be accepted by those people. Yeah, the high society people. Like he, he like he was. But they wouldn't constantly have Constantly obsessed with it. Yeah, they wouldn't have him. But, but, but he was but, constantly but, like, I don't know, mindlessly like driven to be accepted by these people. Yeah, yeah. But you know who w they wouldn't have him because they saw straight through him. Right, he's kind of like no, uh, not that, not, not that there, he was too nouveau riche. These, yeah, not that these like uh, you know American aristocracy folks are <laughs> like the moral. The moral right, so these are the descendants <laughs> of the robber barons we're talking yeah. about. But, but but there's just a new generation of robber barons. It just so happened that they were um, in the former Soviet Union, yeah. and the, and in the meantime, the economy had gone global, so you could move money like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes it would come in through front companies and you, you've had Oliver Bullo on talking about the, the, the technicalities by which, you know, dirty money can go into one pipe of the global economy, yeah. run through the Caribbean a bit and yeah. Switzerland, yeah. the Channel Islands, come out looking with its, with its fingerprints removed, essentially. Yes. Bang, into a piece of Trump real estate. Mm. 
and there's a lots of stories about this in in the book but then the, the, the fascinating thing for me is like when he becomes president he governs as a kleptocrat we, we use euphemisms when this happens in the US you know when covid corruption in the UK we call it you know, chumocracy yeah i call it crime uh, right <laughs> yes <laughs> right precisely if if that same sort of fact pattern if you like it unfolded in nigeria Everyone would be saying, we must cut off aid. Mm -hmm. This is outrageous corruption. Um, in the US, you know, there's a lot of debate about emoluments and so on. But but imagine the, um, let's say, imagine the Malaysian president who'd come to power. And he had, he, his family retained ownership of a, um, a, uh, a, a big hotel in the political quarter of Manila and a beautiful seaside resort. There was no divestment, there was no blind trust. <laughs> and any oil executive, let's say, or visiting despot could put money into the pocket of the president's family directly, openly, hire out a whole suite, literally pay the president. Mm -hmm. it, that would be regarded as sort of la laughable behavior of someone in charge of a banana republic. Yeah, wouldn't it? But look at the allies as well. You know, a talk about a community of kleptocrats. There's private meetings with Putin, his relationship with Kim in North Korea. North Korea, you know, another raging kleptocracy. Again, strip away all the kind of, oh, look at this crazy, crazy sort of place. Look at this, mm. um, the, the, the sort of myth making of the, of the rulers there. Strip it away. Another raging kleptocracy. Mohammed bin Salman, king of the new generation of kleptocrats. These are Trump's natural allies, kleptocrats. So I, I don't know, again, very long answer to your question. But, um, yeah, absolutely. This is kleptopia rising, mm. right? And and the the war in Ukraine. The final point I'll make. The one of the one of the many strange upshots of the war in Ukraine is you can see, and and one that's not discussed at all, or, or very little, not nowhere near enough, is you can see the world breaking into um, these kleptocratic networks and we're networks that are still flailing about trying to. Support preserve something that looks like the rule of the many. Mm. And you can partly see it through the sanctions regime. I mean, Trump used sanctions so liberally as, as only someone so au fait with corruption could because he understood that power is about the enrichment of those who hold it. Mm -hmm. So sanctions is part of that game. But look at what's actually happening now. Sanctions have been used so liberally while allowing the actual rule of law system, the anti-corruption agencies in the West to founder, you know, stripped of budgets. It, the, what's been created is a kind of shadow version of the global economy. You can see this when you look at the deals that are emerging between these, these state subject sanctions. Venezuela doing oil deals with Iran, facilitated by Russia. Okay, so there's, you know, Russian nationalist president, Islamist regime in, in um, in Tehran and the um, nominally socialists in Caracas. Bollocks, a lot of it stripped out of away. That's just what we were talking about earlier. This is mm -hmm. the kind of um, communication, yeah. propaganda between yeah, the ideology the kleptocratic rulers and rulers. Yeah, stripped all this is, these, are just game, these are just um, kleptocratic networks. You see um, Modi's India cozying up to Putin, buying cheap oil, and the, 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 the big emerging powerhouse of this kleptocratic network beijing mm -hmm. again strip away it's a more complicated case than russia how the kleptocracy works there mm -hmm. but, but it went through a very similar transformation from communist to proto-capitalist absolutely and you know i i think it is perhaps a slight oversimplification of people mm -hmm. who understand more about china than i do and i've done some work on china say this is too simple but you know what is the communist party but an engine for the enrichment of its senior ranks i mean that's what it's primarily become. that's what it's become i mean i'm that's probably not it was probably envisioned as a you know the, the necessary the necessary vessel through which they were they can like maintain power within a group of people rather than it being one specific person like the the, the it's like the, the family in the mob, do you know what I mean? It's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, yeah. that's that's basically how I look at it. But I mean, it's a good analogy. Yeah. yeah, like to to yeah. There's two things basically I want to cover here before we finish. 
and the one of them is like has in the west do you think because i want to get to like what happens if we can successfully try and cut some of this out and whether it's even possible due to the amount that 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 corruption has sort of infiltrated our system but like do you think trump has normalized this like looting and uh, that and the, the, the conservatives as well in britain the trump's one i get really concerned about because it, it seems like no one gives a fuck that that his family looted they i don't it really fucks me up it's like you you really you went for the russia thing on the impeachment mm. not the emoluments clause like you like it really pisses me off it's like you had the open goal the literal hope like like the, the the picture just like lobbed the thing in the air for you to smash it out the park and you ignored that and you went for the russia thing like that was far more like ta like intangible and seems like a lot of it was uh, not made up perhaps but based on a lot of conjecture um I mean, that's at least what it seems like what's come out since. But I worry that that, that looting of the of the office, like that that like exploitation of it, perhaps is a better way of putting it, has now become normalized to the extent that like I, I think don't, looting's okay. Yeah, I don't I don't know what the fuck is going on with Hunter Biden's laptop, but it seems like there's an actual story there, and I don't know what to make of it because the mainstream press refused to touch it. Like they don't care that he might be really corrupt, and. I can't tell like how real the stories are. It seems like there's a lot of emails that no one is denying that suggest that he was getting a lot of money because he was Joe Biden's son. And that really worries me because it's like, obviously it's probably not to the extent that Trump's family were exploiting it. And like, especially Jared Kushner, like he made bank, but it just feels like we just go, okay, fine. Doesn't matter. Yeah, I agree. And I, 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 I'm really worried that we've got, we're so apathetic towards it. Because anytime anyone talks about, like, when when you talked about the like the the violence associated with these kleptocratic regimes, like, there's still something visceral that goes, oh, fuck, that's awful. But we seem to ignore the the increasing levels of financial corruption. And do you think we just don't give a fuck, or do you think it's a lack of reporting? Well, like, are you? To to blame personally as the media <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes <laughs> yeah probably <laughs> um i mean there's there's so many but i think that's fascinating I, I... <sighs> hunter biden mm. um there are a lot of questions there yeah i've looked at some of them C clearly he has uh relationships with some dubious figures in Kazakhstan and the club Kazakh kleptocracy mm. and clearly money has moved to him mm. um but I can imagine uh, if that was Mali Obama there's no way that's not front page uh, endlessly I fear that there, I, I, I fear that there is a danger mm. that um the mainstream media is so panicked stricken and discombobulated that it it's taking partisan decisions about what leads to follow mm. like maybe there's so many points you've mentioned i want to pick up on but maybe maybe i'll just pick up on one it's, it's like uh because it's maybe something i know a little bit about it's like you it might be time to get back to basics with reporting mm. news reporting Leave aside questions like what business model is going to support news gathering and is going to pay enough for for it, which is you know when done properly expensive, difficult, d dangerous, and fucking stressful. Mm. Um, it, the, the task of the free press is to surely just to and maybe each individual reporter is to develop sources with access to information about what the powerful are doing in good faith without fear or favor try to discern the quality of that information by developing multiple sources try to discern where the greatest public interest lies and then hell for leather put pursue that wherever it takes you if that takes you towards wherever your natural leanings lie if that takes you towards Ivanka Trump or Hunter Biden's mm -hmm. irrelevant and that's good journalism. I mean, the the the, the best way it was ever put, I think, I know, tragically, I can't remember, Harold Evans, someone at that statue, I think, said that great line about, um, 
I, I'm definitely going to misattribute this, but anyway, the, about uh, the news is something that somebody somewhere doesn't want to come out and everything else is advertising. Mm. I mean, just getting back to that. And it's unfortunate and probably not a coincidence that the the power of, what do you call it, a sort of transnational oligarchy mm. has, has, has massively increased at, at, at the moment that the business model of the news has collapsed. Mm. The internet collapsed it because a pot of advertising that used to fund, mm. you know, five, ten newspapers per country is now spread across a million websites. And, and no one's figured that out yet. That's why, you know, investigative journalism is really hard to do and mm. funding that when you're, when you've been cutting journalists for years from newspaper staffs, it's, it's hard to do. Um, but I, but I do think it's, it's certainly not going to be the answer to pander to what you imagine to be your readers' tribal prejudices in selecting what stories to do. Fine, comment pages, you know. Yeah, go for it. Go for it, mate. But that's not journalism. Well, well, yeah, when it's, extent, it can I, be. I don't. Well, yes, but you I know, don't consider Marina Hyde's columns of journalism on the. <laughs> Um, True. Uh, and, and very good journalism at that. Um, mm. uh, you know, dozens of there are actually some fantastic FT columnists. Sarah O'Connor, Philip Stevens recently retired. There's a, there's, there's a long list, but um, yes, maybe maybe I'm like misattributing that. No, but I, I suppose I suppose what, what I'm getting at is that like um, provocative but well argued mm. debate from a from a position of honest inquiry can be on the comment comment pages or the or the news mm. pages. Just the news pages is this really expensive bit. Yeah. Um so 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 grappling with those questions it, that's essentially these are the nuts and bolts of how to revivify one of those three pillars, right? The free press. Like it's these practical questions, just as there are practical questions about MPs and conflicts of interests that that, that are as much as any sort of high-level theory about kleptocracy and democracy, these, these, these are the important things. Like, how do you restore um, honesty and independence in the political system? How do you reform, you mentioned, um, political funding? Mm. A massive question. I've been writing about Russian money going into the Tory party. That's a huge question. Um, That's uh, another one. Like, why yeah. do people not care? Like, is this, like, this is what really baffles me. Like, it's like easier to talk a little bit less passionately and emotionally about like America because it's you know far away or across the ocean, <laughs> but like here, it just it's like does no one give a fuck? It's like I don't care if you're like uh, like a really like family values like traditional fiscal conservative like Tory, right? How, how do you not care that like your voice is being drawn out? by this like obscene wave of like foreign money, Russian money in a lot of cases. Like then Boris Johnson get like hundred forty five thousand pounds for a for a tennis game? Mm. Like, fuck you. Is is that's how I react to this shit. Like I just I get so like Well I've been writing a bit about you know, it's Ben Elliott. like everyone got riled up about Hillary Clinton taking right. like speech money from right, Goldman Sachs. Right, right, right. It's like this is this is like that's at least she was given a speech. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And after she went all then prior to like running for um, president again but like, enough, yeah. yeah after she left office like boris johnson whilst in office is not even getting it for doing work it's for a fucking tennis game okay but like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> so i've been writing a lot about ben elliott lately so ben elliott a fellow etonian uh, uh, I think contemporary boris johnson i think um and um you know minor royal by marriage he's the nephew of camilla uh Duchess of Cornwall, and um, Ben Elliott's role in the Conservative Party is absolutely fascinating. So he's a man who set up this business quintessentially, which is based on kind of essentially favour trading. He, he's he said something along those lines. It's a club for the very rich from everywhere in the world to get them the things that normal people can't have. Explicitly, that's what it's for. You pay your thousands, and Ben Elliott and his crew will get you things that other people can't have. So he will get Madonna helicoptered the tea bags she wants. He'll get you, I think, like a romantic. He'll get the Sydney Harbour Bridge closed so you can have a romantic dinner. I think someone proposed on an iceberg or something like this. And those are the bits that quintessentially, you know, press operation, which is essentially Ben Elliott giving interviews, put out. 
to the evening standard or whatever it may be. But also there was a big Moscow office. And there was a one stage talk of having um, a part of coincidentally that did specifically uh, offshore finance operations. I think it was going to be based in the BVI. And, and that model that essentially says there is a club and it used to be perhaps in the UK that membership of the club was based on race and family background. Just as membership in the club in South Africa used to be based on being white, membership of the, of the club in China is based on Communist Party credentials and so on. Membership of the club in Saudi Arabia is based on being part of one family. Um, now the club is global and membership is just for sale there are no other criteria and in the UK what you get um, is you can buy your way into that kind of old school high society and the kind of aura of legitimacy and authority that comes with that so you know you can get to see um, Prince Charles. You can get access to very high levels of the ruling party. Ben Elliott seems to have taken that model into the, the heart of British politics. He, Boris Johnson has made him the co-chairman of the Conservative Party in charge of donations. I had a scoop last year, I think it was, about this um, this thing called the... Um, the advisory board, mm -hmm. which I don't think Elliot created, but he sort of supercharged. Uh, the, the premise being that if you give, I think, 250 grand to the Tories, you get access to the top. <laughs> and then I think part of the response was to say, well, you know, obviously, you know, we you know, people can give money, but government would never be swayed by their opinion. It's called the fucking advisory board <laughs> to give advice. <laughs> For one thing, <laughs> there's a clue in the name. But 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 more more broad, more broadly, my 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 worry is that this is this is essentially what's happening everywhere. Is that the, there's a club mm -hmm. to which you can buy access and have things that other people can't have. I mean, we, we were talking earlier about what was the what's the book you're reading? Uh, the social distance between us. Right about the difference between basically rich and poor Britons and their experience of the of the of the yeah, pandemic. Just, yeah, just broadly, like just access to benefits, healthcare, welfare, um, yeah, emergency services, like just like the whole spectrum of yeah, like our different experience in society. But, but yeah, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to like misrepresent Darren's book and say it's like about the pandemic because it, no, it no, is. Sure, but, but, yeah. sure, sure. So that's but that that was one aspect of it. Wasn't yeah. it? yeah, yeah. Um, but the um. I mean, it, it seems to me that that's that's one aspect of what we're talking about. Is that, but and I'm maybe looking at the um, at a kind of transnational end of that, where, and that's what kleptopia is, right? Mm -hmm. You get to go behind the walls, behind the sort of rich red curtain, and and into the club. And the members of the club are London lawyers. Members of the club are um, Putin's KGB mates. Members of the club are. Um, Saudi princes ordering that their members, their, their enemies, um, be dismembered. Um, that's the model of global politics that's, that, that's emerging. Mm. Um, and, you know, you see it so clearly, you see examples of this so clearly in Africa, where I did my first sort of really serious stints of reporting, you see it in places like Angola, where there is, it's physical. Mm. There are hilltop enclaves for the rich, and then there's literally a pipe of shit flowing down to the um, slums below. <laughs> I, I, that, I think that's the danger of, what, of what's emerging. That's that's Trumpian politics as well. Mm. And as we were touching on in the beginning, that the, the way that if you were a member of the club, the way that you try to sustain the loyalty of the masses outside it's by activating their their tribal feelings that we all have within us and buttons that can be pressed that's what that's really what kleptopia is and the, the things i'm going to start to work on more and more now are about 
kind of that manipulation of reality. Mm. Like this guy Hernan Diaz, this wonderful American novelist, he was doing the um, that the New York Times books podcast the other day. He had this fantastic turn of phrase. He's written he's written a book called Trust about um about money, rich wealth in America, and then um, he talked about reality reality becoming the ultimate luxury good. I'm having, you know, having been sued by some oligarchs, and having had surveillance run on me in London by oligarchs, and so on. Like, you start to see that that's the whole game. Actually, it's the manipulation of the stories, it's the manipulation of the reality, and the power to decide one morning the reality is what you want it to be. Which Boris Johnson and Trump seem to do daily. We're hearing, you know, another scandal today about what Boris. <laughs> did or didn't didn't know but says he didn't the the, the 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 difference is you know they don't yet have the ability simply to impose that mm. the, the, there isn't yet this kind of information ecosystem hasn't broken down to that extent in the democracies that that can be done it's getting it's getting pretty murky mm. but it's not russian or north korean no. it's yet obviously or chinese yeah but but what's happening to reality everything from social media to reputation management law firms to propaganda um, to AI to the, to political communication above all that's the key now like to what extent can the members of the club decide what reality is that's that's the heart of the of what's ahead I think wow well that feels like a lovely place to leave it um yeah, we yeah. blast past an hour, so <laughs> yeah, right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'd love sorry. to. I'd love. Sorry, to, I, do, I do waffle on. No, it's fine. I'd love to stay longer if I didn't have this stupid other job that allows me to pay for this. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. And obviously, my you've got to you've got to wire that fifteen grand for me, which is going to yeah. put a hole in your budget. Yeah, I got yeah. to make a few calls. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your usual people, I'm sure. That yeah, they know yeah. what to do. I mean, I just got to plug a few a few lines, you know, on on the podcast, you know, subtly shift the narrative. And, <laughs> <laughs> Some guy accused me of being a grifter the other day. I was like, "How much do you think I'm making off this, man?" Like, <laughs> well, yes. I mean, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't want to complain, but I, I am sometimes amused by how much how the sort of like jet set lifestyle that it's sometimes thought that investigative journalists live. I got one. Uh, there was a, a London law firm once accused me in writing to my editor, working on behalf of a um, corrupt billionaire. Um, Accused me in writing of having accepted an all expenses paid trip to the Kruger National Park in South Africa, mm. at, at, paid for by um, by, a, by a close associate of the President of the Republic of Guinea. Oh, the problem with this smear was that I've never in my life set foot in the Kruger National Park, but you know, it didn't stop them writing it down and sending, and sending it to my editor. You had to sort of oh, ask, Can I just check that this isn't true? Oh. Well, yeah. I mean. You know, but you know, if any, if any of you, if if anyone's offering, you know, trips to the Kruger Park, I'm sure I can get a story in for them. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, I mean, I'd take my be much better paid to be uh to be shilling. I'm sure, right in the right in exactly what the or indeed shillings, wants. but yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a yeah, that's a sign we need to finish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, cheers. But yeah, man. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Great chat. I'm sure once I get the studio in which we can get drunk, then I'll get you back on and we'll we'll get the real stories out of you. Pleasure. Pleasure. I look forward to that. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast. If you want to leave us a comment, that would be awesome. Please like, share, subscribe. And if you're listening on Apple, please leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.